Hello, welcome to part seven. As we go through biological psychology, we're going to be looking at the cerebral cortex, the different parts of the cortex, and uh, some stuff that look with language. So uh, let's jump right in. Um, number first term we're going to look at is glial cells. Glial cells are like glue cells. They're the other type of cell that's in your brain that's not a neuron. So they're not neurons, they're glial cells. Now in your cerebral cortex, which is the outside wrinkly part of your brain, right? There's over 20 to 30 billion neurons in there. Just in, and that layer's thin. That's not big. That's not your whole brain. That's just that little thin outside layer of your brain, the little wrinkly part. That's the newest part of our brain. Neo means new, neocortex. That's where all the action takes place, right? That's what makes humans uh, so impressive as far as the animal species goes. 20 to 30 billion neurons in there, right? That's the stuff that we've been talking about that sends the neurotransmitters, tells us how we should feel, etc. Well, there's nine times as many glial cells in there as neurons. So we're talking 20 to 30 billion neurons and then nine times that in glial cells. So there's a lot of glial cells. You kind of look at it like the neurons are like the um, master of the queen bee. They do the, the major work. They're the most important. And the glial cells are kind of like the worker bees. They're the ones who get a lot of the work done. And they uh, are essential because the queen bee wouldn't be able to do anything without the worker bees. But the queen bees are more essential. So the neurons are the most important part, but they wouldn't be able to get anything done without the glial cells to kind of keep everything together. All right. Moving on, we're, we're going to look at the three... The four different lobes, we've got frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. The frontal lobe is this purple section up here, right? The frontal lobe is involved in thinking and judgment, and then it also is involved with speaking and um, moving your muscles in, a, in a, some way that you want to move them, not just randomly. So this is some higher level stuff going on up here in your frontal lobe. Um, this is where... If you have damage to this, it's going to probably affect who you are, right? If you had to describe who you were as a person, you'd describe things that if something happened to this part, that would probably change how you would describe yourself because you would physically change. You would be able to think the same or make the same judgments. You would be able to speak the same, depending on what part of that lobe was damaged. Um, right behind the frontal lobe is the, um, is the parietal lobe right back here. Uh, the parietal lobe is just roughly right on the top middle of your head on both sides, right? You've got lobes on both sides of your head. So we're looking at the left side of this head right here. So you got lobes on both sides. The parietal lobe is mainly touch and sensory processing. So like your perception, a lot of that goes on here in your parietal lobe. Right behind the parietal lobe at the back of your head is the occipital lobe. And your occipital lobe is responsible for most of your visual processing. So the idea that you have eyes in the back of your head is true. This is where all the visual processing goes through. And then finally, our last lobe is the temporal lobe, which is basically right above your temples, right here of your head. And in your temporal lobe, this receives uh, auditory information, hearing, and it primarily receives information from the opposite ear. So this is the left side. So this is getting information from the right ear, and it crosses over. Your, uh, your, <clears throat> sorry, your occipital lobe handles information the same way. It crosses over before it gets back there. So this is the four lobes. There's stuff that goes on each side of one of these. There's a lot of different things inside, but these are the major parts of it. Um, there's different cortex um, in, in these lobes. The prefrontal cortex is before the frontal, so it's kind of this area right here. You know, so you might all the way back here. This red thing's in the prefrontal cortex. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. So this is the prefrontal cortex. Actually, I think it goes kind of more like this. So cancel that out. The prefrontal cortex is uh, planning and complex behavior, personality, decision making, moderating social behavior. So I think I mentioned in either the last or the one before that of Phineas Gage and how he lost a lot of his social um behavior norms and how to moderate himself and kind of act a little bit silly and 
in polite society, as it were. Um, that's because part of his prefrontal cortex was damaged in his accident with the railroad spike. So prefrontal cortex, huge part of making you who you are. This red section right here is the motor cortex. This is in right up here, right up to where my, that white line ends right here. This is like the edge of the frontal lobe. So this is all in the frontal lobe right here. This whole section right here is the frontal lobe. Um, motor cortex is exactly like it sounds. It tells your body, it provides the motor movement for coordinated movement in your body. So when you're raising your hand, there's an area in your motor cortex that's being activated. Anytime you make a, any sort of movement, your motor cortex is, is being activated. Right behind the motor cortex is the sensory, the somatosensory cortex. That's back here. And so if this was the frontal cortex up here, as we just saw, this is the parietal lobe, right? The parietal lobe back here. And this is where your somatosensory cortex is. And your somatosensory cortex is involved in sensing and perceiving the world around you. So when you touch something, when you hear something, when you feel something, that's... Uh, activating your uh, sensory cortex right here, which is right behind. So motor cortex, frontal lobe, sensory cortex, parietal lobe. And then finally, there's these association areas. The association areas oftentimes are a lot, you're going to see them in the parietal lobe um, when they're described. And the association areas in the parietal lobe um, is they help out. They don't have a specific brain function. They might be these little areas that you, if you made color coding map of your brain of all the different areas, of like we're gonna see in the next slide of like Wernicke's area or Broca's area. They might not fit in one of those areas, but they're involved in that higher order of thinking. So um, learning, remembering, thinking, speaking, these all happen in association areas. So associations don't really have a home, but they're these little areas in here that we still don't know too much about. We're still learning more about. We don't understand exactly where everything is, um, but uh, you know, in the future, this uh, could all change. Last thing we're going to talk about is three things with language. Um, language first, we talk about uh, when we talk about language. We talk about what happens when language goes bad, and we have this thing called aphasia. And aphasia is just an impairment of language. Okay, so if your language either speaking or comprehending, or even being able to uh, not be able to read words and comprehend them off a page correctly. That's all different types of aphasia. You can have different types of aphasia, um, <clears throat> and they just have different names before them. So aphasia is some, any sort of impairment with language, whether it's either actually speaking it or just comprehending it. Um, two areas that we need to know is Broca's area and Wernicke's area. They're named after Broca and Wernicke because these two people um, were doing studies on individuals and they noticed that when this individual had a damage to this particular part of their brain that uh, certain things were lacking. So for instance Broca's area which is right here, the blue part, this is responsible for um, speaking, for actually speaking, right? So this is your auditory, this is, I mean, when you actually move your mouth and speak and make these words, these, right, moving your mouth in a kind of a complex pattern to produce the sounds and make words that make sense to people is not easy, right? That's why babies don't do it right off the bat when they're born. So it's something that needs to be learned. It's a higher order thing. That's why animals can't necessarily speak. Um, so this is in the frontal lobe, right? The frontal lobe to where a lot of our higher level stuff goes on. Uh, Wernicke's area is green. And this is for language comprehension. So this is when we're hearing something, right? This is kind of your ears are right here. And in your ears, right, right above it, you kind of comprehend it. Orange is the angular gyrus. And this pink here is actually your um, auditory cortex. So we talked about your motor cortex up here, roughly, right? Your, your somatosensory cortex here. Your auditory cortex is right down here, right? right next to your language comprehension center and actually your angular gyrus right back here um, also all play a role in language comprehension but uh, Wernicke's area is given all the credit so uh, that's all we've got for today
and uh, my kids are yelling because the movie's over that they were watching, and I'll take off. And you guys have a good one, and we'll see you next time.